Hello, everyone. My name is Jerry Colacino, and uh, I'm with Precision Optical Transceivers. And I've been with the company for four years now, and I'm a principal system engineer. I'm responsible for all customer support, technical support, uh, design, engineering, uh, anything from a technical experience standpoint. Um, I, I have over 25 years in optical network systems engineering, ranging from submarine systems all the way through um, tested measurement to optical components, uh, inside plant and outside plant. And today's topic, we're going to discuss uh, chromatic dispersion in 10 gig DWDM systems. So our agenda for today will be to understand what is chromatic dispersion. We'll understand the effects of chromatic dispersion in terms of network design and use cases. We'll then go into how to compensate for chromatic dispersion. And then we'll look at designing 10 gig DWDM networks for optimal, optimal performance. We'll look at both amplified and unamplified systems. And then we'll also, even though it's a little outside the scope, we're going to take a look at optical signal to noise ratio considerations, which is also an important factor in amplified DWDM systems and networks. So what is chromatic dispersion? And, and the simplest way is to look at a rainbow. And a rainbow in and of itself is you have sunlight, which is your light source. Think of sunlight as your laser source. The water droplets just act as a dispersive medium, which, as you can see to the picture, separates the various rays of lights into their individual components or colors. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Roy G. Biff. So they're the various colors. That's what separates the raindrops, act as that dispersive medium, separating out the various colors of light. So in optical fiber, the concept is exactly the same. The only difference is the wavelength or light is in the infrared or non-visible range. So the fiber, optical fiber itself, acts as this dispersive medium and you have your laser light source. With the laser light source, the actual source is a pulse of light. Not, it's not monochromatic, meaning it's a single individual wave source. It's comprised of many infinite small number of, of incremental wavelengths. And typically, if you look at a 10 gig uh, optical signal, the spectral width is, is, is always less than one nanometer, typically eight tenths of a nanometer, sometimes down to three tenths of a nanometer. But again, all comprised of various individual fractional wavelengths. So as you can see in the, in the graph below, you can see that you have a good solid optical signal to start with, which is your laser source right from the beginning. So that's an ideal pure wave light source. As it begins to travel down the fiber, transverse the fiber, the wavelengths that comprise the individual light pulse begin to separate. Wavelengths will travel faster and wavelengths will travel slower in the, in the optical fiber acting as a dispersive medium. So what ends up happening is the further the distance, the, the actual signal will begin to spread out. So what will happen is the pulses of light that travel faster, travel faster for a greater distance and the optical signals that travel slower will actually lag behind even further. So what you have is basically at the end, chromatic dispersion where the wavelength, as you can see here, it's nice and formed. At the very end, it begins to broaden out and spread out into its various components. What are the effects of that spread? What does it do to your system? As we said, the longer the distance, the greater the effects of chromatic dispersion, meaning that pulse will begin to spread out more and more and more as the distance becomes greater. This will cause, as we've seen, the, the pulse to, or spectral broadening at the receive side of the signal. So your transceiver on the receive is going to see a much wider dispersive signal than what the transmitter initially transmitted at the beginning. The resulting effect is that the receive could have a very difficult time discerning what is a one or a zero in NRZ or digital signaling. And that can lead to increased errors and a degraded bit error rate. So as you can see here, the, the, the pictorial representation to the left you can see 
without chromatic dispersion, this is called an eye diagram. And it's a, a good representation. Up top here is a one, and at the bottom is a zero. And we're looking at a one, one bit in time. So within this eye diagram, there's a sample window. And this is how your receiver on a transceiver decides what's a one and zero. So if it's a nice, clean, and open signal, essentially it's very simple. One zeros, you have, you know, zero bit error rate, everything works fine and your system is happy. But once chromatic dispersion comes into play, say you traverse 80 kilometers, now you can see that that eye diagram begins to compress and it starts to touch or interfere with the sample window where your decision thresholds are made for a one or zero. So every time you could potentially have a bit error rate, a zero can be misinterpreted as a one or vice versa. So what you see to the right is essentially an optical signal. This is a real eye diagram. And you can see, again, the representation, it's a nice wide open extinction. What's called from the top to the bottom is called an extinction ratio. But you can see that the eye diagram is nice, clear, very open. Once you traverse optical fiber, 80 kilometers, now look at the pulse with chromatic dispersion. You can see that the eye begins to substantially close, your extinction ratio substantially decreases, and therefore that sample window, it becomes more difficult to determine ones and zeros. Hence, that's where you start taking bit error rates. So as we've talked about, you could see that in time, ones and zeros are transmitted. What happens is the, the receiver assembles those packets or looks at each individual bit, one and zero, and makes a decision as to whether it is indeed a one or zero. With the overlap of signals as they begin to broaden, that, that timing will allow the signal to essentially uh, bleed over or interfere with adjacent bit times. Therefore, that's called inner symbol interference, and that's where you start having ones and zeros being misinterpreted. So chromatic dispersion, besides increasing bit error rate, also directly reduces the receive sensitivity and therefore your link distance of optical transceivers. We're going to get into that in a little bit more detail and look at link budgets. But the good thing is, is that chromatic dispersion, if you understand it and are aware of it, you can compensate for it, you can calculate it. It's very simple as it's linear in the 1550 nanometer range. And again, you can really manage this over long distances and multiple spans. So the considerations uh, for deployment and taking into account chromatic dispersion is that all transceivers, although we're gonna focus on 10 gigabit transceivers, all transceivers, regardless of data rate, 100 gig, 40 gig, 10 gig, 25 gig, all have or are affected by dispersion. And all data sheets should provide a dispersion power penalty uh, within a data sheet. The higher the data rate, the more impact CD has on that signal. So if you look at, for example, take for example, a 25 gig transceiver, it's two and a half times the data rate of a 10 gig. So to approximate chromatic dispersion or the effects of chromatic dispersion on a 25 gig as compared to 10 gig, you would, it would essentially be the square of the difference of the data rate. So if you take 2.5, square that, it's approximately equal to six. So chromatic dispersion will be six times greater on a 25 gig signal than a 10, 10 gig signal. And one of the reasons for that is that as you modulate a signal, say, com compare a 10 gig signal to a 25 gig signal, as you modulate a laser, it automatically broadens the pulse width. So the actual spectrum begins to widen as you modulate uh, a, an optical signal higher and higher. So it's very important to understand that. As you widen that, that spectral width of a signal, again, you end up with more individual wavelengths comprising that signal, which makes it far more susceptible to chromatic dispersion. And as we've mentioned, receive sensitivity is directly impacted. 
And if you look at a data sheet, you'll always see receive sensitivity as being specified as back to back. So I just took a snippet out of a typical data sheet and here you'll see the minimum receive sensitivity. And this is for uh, an SFP plus 10 gig, 80 kilometer DWDM optic. And it's listed at minus 24 dBm. And again, it's back to back. So what that means is that the transceiver is either looped back on itself or directly connected to another transceiver with minimal fiber. And your OSNR is typically always greater than 30 dB. These are absolute perfect conditions in a perfect world. So if you look at, in terms of a data sheet, there will always be a transmitter dispersion power penalty, or it'll just be listed as dispersion power penalty. For a 10 gig DWDM optic at 80 kilometers, the dispersion power penalty is 3 dB. So what does that mean to your receive sensitivity? So if you look at from the specification, your minimum receive sensitivity is minus 24 dBm. However, at 80 kilometers, at the end of 80 kilometers, your dispersion power penalty will directly reduce your receiver sensitivity by 3 dB. So in essence, at 80 kilometers, you do not have minus 24 dBm on your receiver sensitivity. You effectively only have minus 21 dBm. So since CD is linear at 1550, if you take that same 80 kilometer optic and you only tra traverse 40 kilometers of fiber, it will only reduce your, your receiver sensitivity by one and a half dB, so half of three dB, which would be minus 22 and a half dBm on your receive sensitivity. So very important to take into account, especially trying to obtain link, link margins and managing your systems. So how do you compensate? Once you know chromatic dispersion is there and now you need to manage it, how do you compensate for it? One of the things that's most important is to know the type of single mode fiber. And when I've worked with a lot of customers in the past, it's not always known. It might not have been documented by the outside plant team. It might be very, very old. It could be a third party handoff where it's dark fiber and you don't have any of the technical specifications. So what you'll see is the graph on, on the right shows different types of fiber. And you'll see in the blue representation, G.652, is the most common type of single mode fiber. So when chromatic dispersion is not known, I'll always generally you know, use G.652 standard single mode fiber because it's a worst case approximation. And you'll see some, some venues you know, approximate chromatic dispersion at 17 picoseconds per nanometer kilometer. But I always use a little bit of a fudge factor and state it as 18 picoseconds per nanometer kilometer. So for 10 gig transceivers, again, only for 10 gig, the maximum supported chromatic dispersion is a total of 1,440 picoseconds per nanometer. And essentially it's 18 picoseconds nanometer per kilometer times 80 kilometers gives you the total, total allowance for chromatic dispersion of a 10 gig DWDM signal. This will vary, again, depending upon your data rates. So DCMs, which are dispersion compensation modules, are utilized to negate the positive effects of chromatic dispersion. So there's multiple types of DCMs. There's fiber brag, there's you know uh, fiber spools with negative chromatic dispersion, but generally the most popular DCMs are comprised of X length of fiber, which essentially adds negative chromatic dis dispersion to the system to compensate or negate the total positive chromatic dispersion over a length of fiber. So the length of the DCM will always be determined by your length of fiber over 80 kilometers. And then there's always, you know, on, to be on the safe side, I always add, you know, an extra 10 kilometers of, of chromatic dispersion compensation just to give a little additional budget. So for example, if you take your total link length of let's just say 110 kilometers, then a 30 kilometer DCM would take you back to an effective length of 80 kilometers. Typically I'd go 40 kilometers just for margin, but that would keep the total chromatic dispersion across that 110 kilometer length less than the maximum of 1,440 picoseconds per nanometer. 
Although DCMs do compensate for chromatic dispersion, they come with a drawback in that they do add optical loss to your system. So the greater the length of the DCM in terms of compensation, the higher the loss will be. So now we'll jump in and understand what does all this mean when you begin to design DWDM systems. So if you look at the first example, it's pretty straightforward. It's a 10 gig DWDM design in an unamplified link, you know, less than 80 kilometers. So in less than 80 kilometer links, the most important point of all of this is really calculating and understanding your link budget. So the first objective is, is to understand what allowable link budget does your transceiver provide so typically for an sfp plus 10 gig dwdm signal rated at 80 kilometers your minimum transmit power is typically zero dbm so you'll see two specs for transmit power one will be minimum one will be maximum so it could typically range from zero to plus four or plus five dbm you always take the minimum number worst case specifications at all times to calculate link budget. So you'll take zero dBm, which is your minimum transmit power, and also your minimum received sensitivity, which is minus 24. That will provide you with a, an SFP plus 80 kilometer optic, 24 dB of actual link budget. Now, in order to calculate your link margin, you take your SFP plus transceiver link budget, which provides you with 24 dB. That's in green, that's your available total link budget. Now you need to go in and look at all your individual losses in your system. So if you take a look at your fiber loss over 50 kilometers, if you don't have an OTDR trace, normally you'd want an OTDR trace of that 50 kilometers to have an exact measurement. Uh, but typically I'll use you know, 0.24 dB per kilometer. So that is 12 dB of loss across 50 kilometers. You have to take into account your MUX and DMUX for an eight channel, you know, typically three dB loss. So that's times two, which gives you six dB of loss due to your MUX, DMUX. And you have to look at your individual patch cords in the system, six tenths of a dB. And now you also need to take into account your, your chromatic dispersion power penalty. So over 50 kilometers, you can easily calculate it out and essentially you lose almost 2 dB of received sensitivity due to chromatic dispersion over 50 kilometers. So if you take 24, subtract out all your losses in the system, you end up with a total link margin of 3.5 dB. And the goal is in designing any DWDM or any networking system is to typically have uh, a link margin of 3 dB. If you push to the very edge, 2 dB is still acceptable um, as a worst case scenario, but I would typically never go below 2 dB on any link margins. Where things begin to get a little bit more detailed or you really need to pay attention is when you start getting into amplified links, which are greater than 80 kilometers. So in this particular DWDM, 10 gig DWDM design, you'll see here that at this point, we begin to introduce amplifiers, a booster amp on the transmit side and a preamp on the receive side. And we begin to introduce um, dispersion uh, compensation modules. So in this design, it's a two fiber design, um, upstream and downstream uh, system. And what you can see here is we have a 16 channel MUX DMUX with 3 dB loss on each side. You have a 100 kilometer span length, which equates to a 24 dB loss. On the transmit side, you'll see that we have a booster amp. And on the receive side, you'll see we have a preamp to amp the, the uh, signal after it traverses the 100 kilometers, boost that signal, and then we go through a dispersion compensation module to get the dis total dispersion compensation less than the 1,440 picoseconds per nanometer and then on the receive side of this equipment. And this is just re replicated on the opposite length. So as we've discussed, the minimum transmit power of an SFP plus 80 kilometer DWDM optic is zero with the min receive sensitivity of minus 24. 
So your overall total available link budget, again, is 24 dB. When you now look at your calculated system, and there's uh, ideally, you know, technical information or thought that needs to go into your booster amps, what's your input, what's your output, what type of gain do you need, the same thing on your preamp. We're not going to get into those details, but your SFP plus transceiver will give you a link budget of 24 dB. Your booster amp, in this case, has a gain of plus 10 dB. Your total fiber loss is 24 dB. You have your mux demux loss on both ends, which is 3 dB times 2, a total of 6 dB. Your total of all your patch cords, which you see here, taking those into account, is 2.1 dB. We have another gain in the preamp, which is another 10 dB gain. We have the loss of the, of the dispersion compensation module. So for a 30 kilometer uh, DCM, it's on average about three and a half dB. And then we have to take into account dispersion power penalty. Now, although we have a 100 kilometer link, keep in mind, we added a 30 kilometer DCM. So the effective total disper uh, effective chromatic dispersion in this link would essentially be 100 kilometers less or minus the 30 kilometer DCM because you have 100 kilometers of positive chromatic dispersion. Now we add in 30 kilometers of negative chromatic dispersion. So the effective length from a chromatic dispersion standpoint is 70 kilometers. So you can calculate out since it's a linear relationship that at 70 kilometers, instead of 3 dB, you'll have 2.6 dB of loss due to chromatic dispersion. So if you sum up all your everything in green, so you have roughly 44 dB um, in terms of optical you know, output, and you subtract out all of your loss in the system, you end up with a total link margin of 5.8 dB. Once you start getting into amplified systems and especially multiple spans or multiple segments of amplifiers in an overall system, OSNR really comes into play. And OSNR is in fact extremely important, similar to chromatic dispersion and understanding the negative impacts in your system. Although it's kind of outside the scope of chromatic dispersion, the two are very, very important factors in calculating or understanding your network or your system. So OSNR is measured with an optical spectrum analyzer, and it's directly the correlation uh, of the signal. Um, typically, you'll set the resolution bandwidth of an OSA to 0.1 nanometers. So under the signal itself, at, it, it'll sum up all of the power at 0.01 nanometer resolution bandwidth, find the noise floor, and then sum up all of the noise at the same resolution bandwidth and do a comparison. So the point is, is that the higher your signal is compared to the noise floor, the better your OSNR is. And the better the OSNR is, the less effect or negative impact it'll have to your receiver sensitivity. And this becomes critically important in amplified or multi-span networks. So the caveat and, and the learning experience here for OSNR in a multi-span system is that low OSNR, like chromatic dispersion, is going to negatively impact your receiver sensitivity. You will always need to know OSNR to figure that into your link budget calculations. Failure to do so will cost you link margin and could substantially in the future or right off the start impact your bid error rate and performance. Amplifiers, erbium dope fiber amplifiers, Raman amplifiers, there's all different types, while increasing optical power also adds and amplifies the noise floor along with the base signal. So the increase in the noise floor relative to the base optical signal will decrease your OSNR. The more links and spans you have in a system, the more amplifiers, the more you need to understand and, and, and calculate OSNR in the system and keep it measured and monitored. In general, for 10 gig DWDM systems, an OSNR greater than 27 dB 
is going to have zero or negligible effect on your receive sensitivity. You will see OSNR of 25 dB and even lower in amplified systems and even multi-span amplified systems. So when OSNR approximately of 25 dB will directly impact your receiver sensitivity by one and a half dB. You drop down to an OSNR of 23 dB and that's going to result in a 3 dB impact to receive sensitivity. So you can see here from these approximations, add OSNR, the, the, the negative impact of, of low OSNR with the impact of chromatic dispersion, you can start to see just how much and how negatively your receiver sensitivity and your link margins can be impacted. So OSNR, it should always be on an, on your specification sheet or there should, should be some type of reference and always keep that in mind with CD in your link budget calculations to ensure good link margins and therefore good performance on your DWDM systems. I'd like to thank everyone and uh, pardon the poor engineering humor, but I hope some of you were enlightened and uh, found some useful information.